Okay, let's look at Bellinius, the mighty Gaulish god of light, often associated with Lu and Apollo. You know, when we do these religious comparative videos or comparative study videos like these, there's very many people that are into this study and they'll try to show you the slight difference that's always there between them instead of saying, well, it's not exact carbon copy, therefore, and try to de deviate from there. Far fewer spend the time to show you how much there's connections of them and how few disconnects there are. Fewer still will try to show you that there's a reason while sometimes this other god got taken into a god of harvest for his connections to rain and water and things like that. And in that pantheon, it's a different way. And other than that situation, they are pretty much carbon copies. And so fewer still will try to make the connections back to before the people were the people that we're even looking at and discussing they had something going on thousands of years before and it was extremely similar to each other knowing so we can look at linguistics such as the Aryan languages and how it deviates out from Sanskrit to ancient Irish and Old English and other languages that we've done in other videos but also you can find it in just the way that the religion is spoken of the way certain deities are spoken of, even certain passages that people have noted from the Bible are exactly the same passages written by about Baal, which of course is another variation of this that they don't really get into in this idea, but I want you to keep that idea and know how much it goes along with this same idea. They're trying to show you that Belinus or Bel the mighty Gaulish god of light is often associated with Lu and Apollo. Now the Gaulish god Bel or Belenus, depending on if you want to go Latinized with it and so on, whose worship goes back to deep antiquity, was a widely recognized deity associated with healing, springtime and its rites, festivals, protection over people, and on occasion with the sun. It's not too hard to look at this deification here showing of him and how he might look like a deification of the sun. He has a crown upon his head that has the flames of the sun and it is looking like an aura, but it also has hearkenings of a bull's horn. Indeed, he's called bull. And there are a lot of people that say bull and its origins directly come from the name Bell and his association with what other people call Taurus and Toro. Toro Toro or El Toro is the bull in Spanish and Latin linguistics. So there are many different words and many different names for these type of gods. And when you find one that's extremely close and you can see the linguistic catch with it, people try to find the difference rather than the connective. Here he is with his spear type thing, and you can see on the far left it splays out into something that looks quite like a trident. It's uncovered arms, but he has bracelets, and in like Dungeons and Dragons campaigns, his little things that go along with him have special effects that go along, and once you use them for their trade, whoosh, they disappear in the overnight and they're gone. That's the way you usually tr portray them. One interesting thing about this picture here, of course, he's shown in a golden robe, which you would think of a sun god and how well that goes with it, but also yellow robes are associated with many things. But also this shield, which is not even the size of a common buckler that we think of, which is a micro shield, would barely cover their hand very much, but it's not really a shield, for it's a belt chest armament type situation. And if we think about all the other videos where we see the Proto-Indo-Europeans and their sun worship, and even the witch hats that have that exact same symbology right there, this is a little more intricate in the inner rings off of it, but I bet you that it would be even more information and more information. For instead of having all of the rings drawn out and the declamation of each one, showing the sun and the moon going out through, this is a one symbol with the declamation written out there. So you could do that in different ways.
Now, of course, this is just a painting, and I don't know that they've even got that all connected with it and so on. But it does look like I see some crescent moons going around the left side that start to get lessened and lessened as they come around the top. Let's just continue. It's the continental god Belinus. His name is probably a Latinization of the god Belli, or Bel, worshipped by the Celts, who inhabited the European continent before being driven away by the Romans. Great and powerful Belinus, we honor you this day and thank you for your gifts. You are known by many names. You are the light over the crops in the fields, the heat that warms the earth, the hope that springs eternal and bringer of life. One could probably hear that in a spring or Easter ceremony about common religions here, and it wouldn't be too far off base, would it? Well, one of the things he's definitely associated with is the bringer of life, the bringer of light in this type of situation. And of course, spring rides are whenever spring and the amount of sunlight takes over the amount of darkness and percentage, and there's more light in the day than there is darkness. And it goes through the summertime and then it wanes in the fall and goes to the death of winter and so on. That's why Jesus is associated with the death of winter and rebirth and how it connects. Yeah, and we do the Easter thing off of him too. But hope that springs eternal. Certain words that are in here in this ancient saying that goes along with Belinus is very common with a lot of others. Some are even more telling to a lot of researchers because it will describe him as a bull and start telling you his attributes rather than just telling him or praising him in a certain way. But to call him the light over the crops in the fields, the heat that warms the earth, one would never make the connotation that he's a sun god, huh? that was sarcasm or attempt at it it seems like it's pretty much shown right there but then again all Aryan worship here back did work off of sun worship and things and so there's all aspects that go with that just like the planets are all hooked up off the sun and things even though it's looked at as where Zeus is the king of things throwing lightning bolts but let's get into that in a little bit related to Apollo but not in Celtic culture, they say. In, in ancient depictions, this deity was recognized as the equivalent of the Roman god Apollo, a god of light and the sun, but sometimes associated with the god Lu. Now, you know, we have Luians too, but also the Illyrians had associations with this Lu, so it, it definitely can have its own. I've had mentions in other videos about him when we were talking about this last year and running through the whole mythology of it which I still have two vids left up to go, so maybe I'll catch into it here and go through another wave of it. Sometimes I feel if I stay too long in one pantheon and thought that people get old with it, especially if they know about it or it doesn't seem to interest them in some way. Belinus is often depicted riding the sun across the sky in a horse-drawn chariot. Does that sound familiar? Other depictions show him riding a horse and throwing thunderbolts by using his wheel as a shield. Both the wheel and the head with the solar rays and halos are associated with Belinus, but that's associated with all these other gods and still in the depiction of Jesus, although of course those people never really had horses and so they worked off a donkey, didn't they? Yeah, that sacred donkey. Yeah. You can actually take Pegasus and other things and just substitute horse with donkey. The line surrounding Belinus' head could probably symbolize the warm, glowing rays of light coming from that sun god. As we know, the god Apollo acquired power over medicine, healing, and disease after he was established at Delphi. Well, yeah, but r what really even sealed that pretty much is his son is Asclepius and Asclepius is the great healer and he's one of the guys that actually Jesus had to 
come over and, and do. You know, certain guys walked on water. Well, Jesus had to pull that off. The water into wine type thing, you know. and <coughs> Sorry. Of Bacchus and so on that went on. And so he was able to pull off anything. It's like, yeah, I can do your tricks. Kind of like in Egypt where at first they could pull off each other's tricks. And then it got out of hand because... Well, then all of a sudden it became curses and all this bad thing happening. But that's not about this video. Let's continue. But God of medicine and healing and so on. But the sun has healing powers and so on. And it also grows the crops that are the herbs and the roots and things like that that go to healing and so on. So it's his power that continues to do it. So again, you can really connect so many things to a sun god. In Celtic culture, however, Bellinus was associated with health and fountains and health and the pastoral lifestyle. And did I say health? Now they've got it written in there twice. Well, so maybe they really meant to say healing, fountains, health, and the pastoral lifestyle. And of course, a more pastoral people would have connections to this. Here we see a depiction of Apollo. The sun god and sun disc behind him riding upon a chariot that's very much like the Proto-Indo-European one that you always see facing the other way with all the symbols on it. And the gold leaf that only has a little bit left, but it has those symbols I was just talking about earlier. And here we can see that there's a face looking back on his chariot as he's whipping the horses over here to the right. And he's a red-headed type guy, and you'd think that he'd have a hell of a lot better tan than that going on if he was a sun god, but no, nah, he's a red-headed guy. He's not pulling off that much of a tan burning across the sky. But now we look at that wheel, and strangely, that's that same spoked wheel. It's got those special legs on it and the symbol of the sun god in the center of it, and it's breaking it off into the same thing as the zodiac type. Yeah. And, and, and the variation of the labrys that we talked about recently and so on. And you can see here that his foot is firmly placed upon a lion's head that's holding the reins that are the helper, or the main holder of the beasts of the whole chariot, and then he's just guiding them. Sometimes this is a dragon. Sometimes in the older depictions, like I've shown you in the Greeks and so on, before the horse situation, there are dragons and other situations who are pulling this across the sky. There's Apollo. But Apollo is the twin brother of his sister, Artemis or Diana, the queen of hunting. And he's also well known in archery. In fact, they're pretty much accredited with inventing it in the first place and so on. And so there's quite a few discrepancies if you want to pick it apart. His other associations were with the symbols of the phallic-shaped stone, the bull, the oak tree, and the horse. And we can see a lot of connections in trees and everything that we've talked about here. I could go off for 30 minutes at this moment. But if you've been watching my videos, that right there will make a big connection for you who this guy's connected to. As one of the Celtic high gods, he was known in Ireland, Scotland, Wales, France, Italy, Spain, and England, and other locations all across the Mediterranean and into the lands of Canaan and Baal. Yeah, there can be a variation on a theme. Sure, it's slightly different, but aren't there slight differences in the cultures that slowly over time happen? Just like a moment ago, we talked about a pastoral civilization having a different aspect on the same situation and who would be the grain god of that and who would be more connected with other things he had many names similar names like Belin, Belinus, Belon, Bel, Baal depending on tradition, language, and place of worship his attributes included the capacity for healing which earned him the award of being a god of medicine and a divine healer but again, his son Apollo was the guy that really kicked off healing. And if you look into it and look at the readings of it, he was quite the philosopher too. Yeah, his lament for the world and the way things, he looked like things were going to go if we didn't straighten up, which the Greeks were quite fond of doing, such as Atlantis and other stories, is uh, quite the thing. Uh, I recently heard uh, Graham Hancock reread that out at the end of one of his 
dissertation. It seemed like he had five minutes, and he goes, I, I think I'll read this. Due to his healing functions, he was worshipped as a master of power. The powerful one and the healing waters included aqua boronis or bourbon labanes, like bourbon, you know, that you drink alcohol, in France, and water sanctuaries such as Sacred Springs and St. Sabine, Burgundy in France. Sabine, like the Sabine River here that runs through Texas. Although Texas wasn't part of the French connection type thing, it is a border river named in the same way in the areas conquered by the Roman Empire he was identified with Apollo this association was not due to solar imagery they say but rather healing capacities in various records Bellinus also appears as a pr protective deity of the livestock and crops along with areas related with agrarian activities so even in himself, Bellinus is a little more this way if he's an agrarian society, and a little more that, so it twists a little bit. Just like in a modern day, there are definitely twists and thoughts on Jesus Christ. And if you look at the way that he's looked at from the Middle East to the Northeast to places like Russia to places like England and Britain or even in America, and start comparing those and the ideals and the flavor that people all have for it, especially in a modern day where people try to influx all type of connectives in there and inclusivity that isn't written in there, you can see quite a bit of difference. And it's not just a carbon copy necessarily. But we could probably see the same thing with Bell and Ball and the other gods that we're discussing now as a variation on a theme. Traces of his worship found mostly in Italy and France, though. Oh, left this out. In various record, Bellinus also appears a perfected deity of livestock. Oh, I said that, didn't I? The ritual protection was held in honor of this deity. So in ritual, both cattle and crops were purified with the intention of ensuing prosperity for the following year. And again said to this deity here so traces of his worship found mostly in Italy and France inscriptions dedicated to Bellinus were found in many sites he was worshipped among the Illyrians as I said earlier in central and southern Gaul in the eastern Alps and in Aquilia like Aquilonia in northern Italy or the Etruscan type lands where scholars identify as many as 51 of them in the third century this god was the patron deity of the city yeah, so you think the Romans and everything, and it all flipped over real quick and everything. It didn't really work out that way if you go off into it either. And as late as the 3rd and 4th century, Christianity swept in. And then there was the Crusades and all the things that happened in the Dark Ages. And usually I don't try to go past this type time here and much earlier. But So in the 3rd century, he was the god made, main patron god of the city and most popular divinity, according to Aelius Herodinius, one of the most celebrated grammarians of Greco-Roman antiquity, Herodinius, or Dianus, the Roman histories, equated Bellinus with Apollo. However, it was only confirmed in a few of the inscriptions. If you'll look here, here's a carved out ivory that's going on. And all around him are like Celtic swirls going on the left and right. But they're kind of like a swastika type thing swirl too. But no, it only has the triad already. So it already has the triad symbol used in the same way. Yeah, there's there's a three connection to the three god symbol. And I made other videos about it before. But just to make a easy clarification onto it, there's the underworld, the real world, and the heavens. There's three in connective. It always works together. One and one together make a third. Uh, God and his wife, Asherah, end up making Jesus type concept. It all works that. Once that works itself out, everything's just fine. Well, they had pantheons that had a lot of names and depths to them, so that's well confirmed, and they've got it all going on. Other ones seem to not be able to 
um, to really take everything to term and to finalize it to a point that there are so many questions left wide open. But if you look at, you know, the Greeks and their flippant type of religion that went on with the Olympians and stuff, one would probably say that's lacking in very many ways too. So you look at this guy and he has kind of an Aragon kind of concept going on with him. Somewhat a Jesus concept too. A small band for a king's shine, but then a sun symbol on his head. If you shine that up real good, of course, that could cause a gleam to come right back at you, almost like a flashlight. He has a torque around his neck. And that twisted rope made gold around his neck so that gives another indication here is that strange but not so strange if you're into it elven type of clasp brooch that's used to hold in capes he's shown here as being nude except for armbands on but I swear if you look at his body you can see tattoos over him there's a little paisley design that's here there's a filigree swirl that's going on the Pictish type people had very much adopted that healing, especially used sacred tattoos on their arms and hands, and they used it for healing. That can be found in Egypt, that can be found all the way through the Mediterranean, and pretty much all Proto Aryan type people. Tattoos I've shown you all from the ancient Proto Indo Europeans all the way through to Utsi the Iceman that predates the pyramids having it on him but then there's Ginger the pre-dynastic blonde Gibeline mummy in Egypt that has tattoos all over him but last year I showed one where they had tattoos on their arms that they knew the symbols were for healing and for power and then this person was supposed to have been in the healing temple yeah so kind of worked all together with each other but also, other than this whole sun symbology that's going on here, and if he just stood with his arms bent like a, uh, walked like an Egyptian, it'd look very like Shiva, but no, this is a different concept here. And you see him with that stalk of grain that's next to him, still pulling off the spring symbology and going on, wearing somewhat of a kilt-type skirt, but if you look under that, he's wearing pants, and he's got boots on. Herodotus in the Roman histories equated Belinus with Apollo. However, it's only confirmed in a few inscriptions, they said. Herodianus, or Herodian, writes that the god Belinus appeared in a battlefield in Achilia, Italy. The emperor Maximus besieged the city in 238 AD, but oracles testified that the city would be protected by Belinus, who was later attested to have been seen hovering over the soldiers. Aquilia was really a very tough city, huh? It was defended by the former consuls Crispinus and Minophilus, Minophilus, or Minophilus, and it did withstand the siege, outlasting the emperor who was assassinated within four months. Well, the siege went on longer than that. Another author, Iulius, or Julius, Capitolonius, there was no J until modern times, so Iulius, from 380 to 350 AD or so, they referred to Bellinius as Apollo or the sun. Traces of his worship in ancient times were found in other places in Europe as well, and most probably the European settlers had their ritual site dedicated to Bellinus at a site in New Hampshire called Mystery Hill, where a stone tablet with an Ogham inscription dedicated to Bell, it says directly on it was discovered in 1967 and translated by Dr. Barry Fell, who's president of the Epigraphic Society. The ancient author Apollonius relates a Celtic story of a stream formed by the tears of Apollo, Bellinus, when he was forced from heaven by his father, as Apollo was the Greek sun divinity. This textual evidence strengthens the arguments that Bellinus had solar connections and in Britain, a hero, Bellinus, was mentioned by the early historian Joffrey of Monmouth as the twin of Brennius. The two went to war over the throne, but ultimately agreed to share power. 
The continental god Bellinius is not described as warlike necessarily, so despite the similarity in names, it is not clear that the same figure is intended. So, whenever you have a people that are not having to engage in a war, even though you know in not too long past before that, they were very much so engaged in war, they can have an easing of their necessarily their warlike gods people over time that were having to perhaps go back and forth and back and forth and warring and things it really gets old one things that comes to mind was even whenever alexander the great was conquering the world and having such a great time his soldiers at the end there were very much wary of battle Everybody's well aware of it. They got studies into it that they were well past the point that they thought that, that you know we've we've done it all. But he wanted to finish it off correctly. And then, say la vie, he get, went from there. And a lot of those type connotations are also taken into a modern religion too. But that's for other videos, I guess. But here, hopefully, if you've done any studying on Baal and all the Anatolian gods that went along with this, it has very much a connection. If you just wiki these people and look up their names, it'll tell you that there are connections to the Hurrians and so on, too. And that has connections, of course, to ancient Anatolia. Like, share, and subscribe, and enjoy, and we'll get on to another topic. Got a few lined up here that'll have something to do with this. And other aspects. Peace.